Today's webinar will be about uh, open data. So last time we have uh, delineated our catchment and now we want to populate that map, that project with open data. And uh, today I'm gonna show you what's there to, to do that. So I'll first introduce myself. I'll keep it a bit short this time because we have quite a varied program. Um, because later Kurt will uh, tell you about uh, the QGIS community because QGIS is not just great software, but it also has a great community and you can be part of it. And uh, we also, after the, uh, the exercise, we have a mystery guest uh, that's related, of course, to today's topic. I'm very happy uh, to, to have uh, this person here. I'm not gonna give it away yet. And then we'll have time to, to ask the, the, the questions and, uh, and, and until the, uh, the geo beers. So I'm uh, Hans van der Kras, senior lecturer at IHG Delft Institute for Water Education. In my background, I'm a physical geographer. I studied at uh, Utrecht University in the center of the Netherlands. And I also did my PhD there on the integration of satellite uh, data in uh, soil moisture modeling, fieldwork in uh, Morocco and Spain. And uh, then I started working at the Flemish Institute for Technological Research as a researcher in environmental modeling, uh, working on land use change models, uh, urban remote sensing for urban heat islands, uh, water quality, those kind of things. Active with open source already at that time, we had a nice team working on, uh, on Python and exchanging knowledge. Since 2012, I work at IHC Delft as a lecturer in eco-hydrological modeling. I'm a board member of the Dutch QGIS user group, which was just established uh, at the end of last year. And uh, I'm teaching uh, GIS and remote sensing in, in my institute, but uh, my interests are uh, also, well, anything with open source GIS, uh, modeling, remote sensing. I'm a QGIS certified instructor which means that uh, with all the courses you follow with me, uh, you will get the official QGIS certificate um, after successful completion, which supports uh, QGIS, but also uh, you have something uh, which is uh, an international certificate and our institute shows that we support uh, this great open source uh, GIS. In our institute, we have a nice group on uh, QGIS for uh, uh, remote sensing for hydrology, where we work on water accounting and uh, water productivity, for example. Um, I will show you a little bit about open data that, uh, that we use there. Um, in my projects, I work on spatial data infrastructure, sharing of data. That's uh, if you connect many GISs uh, together, you'll get that and uh, the open standards and open data. That's all the topic of today. So I'm gonna tell you more about that later. And uh, as I say every week, we are not just people behind the desk, although now we are a bit uh, locked in because of the situation. Um, but normally we also like to be out of the f uh, in the field and I know that many GIS people are also field people I also like Kurt to be out there and uh, do hiking and, and making maps of the things that you see so field work is an important part of, uh, of the GIS world and there are great tools also you can use for that if you want to contact me you can send me an email uh, connect through LinkedIn or other social media um, I'm gonna give the word to, uh, to Kurt to introduce himself hi everyone um... Kurt Menke. I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, USA, and I run my own uh, consulting business named Bird's Eye View. And I'm also part of the Q Cooperative, which is a venture that started up about a year ago, um, which is myself and several core QGIS committers and um, documenters and trainers um, looking to provide support services for QGIS. So if people need custom um, functionality or plugins written, um, people at the Q Cooperative can help with that. Uh, I also run a program called Community Health Maps, which I'll talk about a little later. And I do a whole mix of spatial analysis, cartography, teaching. I wear a lot of hats being self-employed. And um, in addition to uh, me co-authoring QGIS for Hydrological Applications with Hans, I've written um, several other QGIS books. Um, another recent one is Discover QGIS 3X, which is a big 400-page workbook. Um, that you could use to uh, get a really thorough treatment of all the capabilities in QGIS. And um, I'll kind of keep it short today because we're going to um, have a, a longer uh, program. Uh, but you can find me via email by the addresses at the bottom or LinkedIn or GeoMenke at Twitter. Great. Well, Kurt, you're also the next one uh, to present. So I'm going to stop sharing these slides and you can uh, show yours, which will be all about the QGIS community. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the QGIS community. And I think a lot of you are probably aware of this, but if you've never really thought about it, when you first download and start using QGIS, you're joining a community. 
And so QGIS is a software, but it's also a community and an organization. So these pictures that I'm showing here are some, from some of the recent QGIS um, contributor meetings. This is the last one that was held in Spain. So QGIS as an organization, um, you can find this flowchart online and it operates um, as a democracy basically. So there is a project steering committee, uh, PSC, with a chair and a board and they vote on um, important issues around the QGIS project. And there are other um, components of the QGIS organization. So there are national QGIS user groups and every national QGIS user group gets one vote um, on issues that come before the PSC. There's also um, some QGIS committers who have been appointed as voting members to the PSC. So collectively, um, there's a lot of representation and ways to be involved even on official decisions um, within QGIS. So um, what makes QGIS such a success? Well, part of it is that there are, you know, it's just a, a fantastic piece of software, but th that's really because of the people, the community around it. And it's you as a user. So again, Everyone on this webinar is part of the QGIS community by default. And um, whether you're contributing code or doing other things, just using the software, working with other people, you are part of the community. And so that combined with the internet, especially these days with COVID-19, um, all the collaborative tools we can use to work together, even though we're on different continents, that's really what makes QGIS such a success. So it's a real team effort. And QGIS really strives to be um, a friendly, inclusive, respectful community. And so there is a code of conduct, for example. The, there's a link down below at the bottom of the slide that you could go to to see what the code of conduct is for QGIS.org. And I think one of the nice things about QGIS is that um, there's not really a barrier between being a user and being a developer. A lot of the developers are users. A lot of users write plugins and, and use code. And you can contact people who are writing new features. You can ask people questions. In fact, when you get on GIS Stack Exchange or one of the QGIS listservs, you know, you're talking to someone in the community. And so it's a, it's a broad array of, of people around the world that make this all work. So here, just to put some faces, um, to some of these people, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to name everyone on here, but these are some of the people who are, you know, heavily involved in the QGIS project. The one person I will name here is Gary Sherman in the upper left, who's the one who started the QGIS project and now runs Locate Press that Hans and I published through. So these are all people just like you and me, and I think it's really nice that we can all um, work together, and even if we're on different continents, you know, there's regular communication via listservs and IRC and um, GitHub that allows all of the decisions to be made and all the great software to be produced. And kind of as part of this, I wanna give a thanks to Andreas Newman. A lot of these slides I'm showing you right now were um, either taken or inspired by his 2019 Acarunia presentation. So it's kind of part of uh, the openness of the community. Oftentimes when someone gives a, a talk, they'll make the slides available afterwards um, and, and welcome people to use them. So um, I just wanna give a shout out to Andreas for compiling some of what I'm showing. And so obviously I think the first thing people think about when you talk about contributing to a, an open source project like QGIS is source code, but there's a lot more than that that goes into making QGIS function. So there is all, all, all of the writing of plugins, um, co coding of, of QGIS itself, but there's also um, things you may not have thought about like maintaining the IT infrastructure and the servers mm -hmm. and things like that behind QGIS. And then there's all the people who are making training materials and issuing certificates and um, contributing financially. So some of these, it doesn't really show up probably very well, but some of these are in green and some of these are some of the non-technical ways that you can contribute to QGIS. So um, donating money, running a local user group, organizing local events, um, 
answering questions online. These are all ways that, you know, anyone can be part of the, con the community and contribute to it. So an another um, thing I recommend, if you haven't been to one, is um, the next time we're allowed to have face-to-face -face meetings <laughs> is attend one of the contributor meetings or um, one of the local user group meetings in your area. And so these are pictures. Um, I've always found these um, great. I can't wait till we can all get back to meeting face-to-face. -face. I'm really grateful that we can all meet on Zoom right now, but these face-to-face -face meetings are really important to keeping the community alive. and um, some of the relationships I've um, created, like meeting Hans. I met Hans at a QGIS um, Hackfest. So um, these are really important events. And so these are just some shots from um, different events that have happened around the world. So um, there are a lot of local user groups as well. In fact, there are um, official national QGIS user groups. So for example, Hans mentioned that there's now a Dutch QGIS user group in the Netherlands, and there's um, a US QGIS user group that I'm part of, which is much smaller than it should be given the size of our country here. Um, but there's, there may be one in your country. You can go to the link at the bottom of the slide to see um, what user groups are out there and if there's one in your part of the world. And if there isn't, you could be the one to start organizing that and setting up a QGIS user group. So these become places where you can meet other people in your community who are using QGIS and share knowledge and network, um, show tips and tricks, even do some fundraising. Some of the larger QGIS user groups are some of the largest funders to the QGIS project itself financially. So there's a lot of um, important communication that goes on by local user, um, user groups. And so this is a map that shows um, all the national user groups that are out there. And I think this is still pretty up to date, but all the ones in green are countries that have a QGIS user group and an official one. So if you're not in one of these um, green areas, you could start one. If you are, you could contact people um, from the link at the bottom of this slide um, and find out who is kind of doing the organizing in your country and um, start participating in that. So another thing I wanted to mention, because Hans and I are both really involved in this, is that um, for education, there's a QGIS certification program. And so in a nutshell, this is um, a program designed to provide high quality education in QGIS, but also community involvement in the project. So one of the things that happens if you want to apply to become a QGIS certified organization, um, one of the things that you're asked for is documentation on all the ways you've contributed to the QGIS project. And if you haven't really been an organization that's contributed yet, you'll be asked to do that and reapply. So um, everyone who is handing out QGIS certificates, all the QGIS certified organizations, are organizations who are giving back to QGIS in some way. It's also a way to um, provide revenue for the QGIS project. So. If you are in a course um, that where you receive a QGIS certificate from the instructor, part of the um, certificate is a 20 euro donation back to QGIS.org. So I think, was it last year, there was over 5,000 euros raised for QGIS through the certificate program. Um, and this, is, uh, this woman is Anita Grazer, who you've probably heard of if you've been on Twitter or Stack Exchange or anywhere online related to QGIS. And at some point, I don't know if she originated this, but she called QGIS a duocracy. And I always really liked that term. And I found out there's actually a, on the community wiki, a page about duocracy and what it means if you want to look it up. But this slide you're looking at, this little GIF is um, showing the unique values palleted raster renderer that Hans has showed um, a few different times in this webinar series. So um, a few years ago, this didn't exist. And myself and some other users were wondering, you know, trying to figure out how to render rasters that were categorical and had some kind of unique value. And this, the one that you're looking at on the screen here is vegetation. And eventually, um, one of the developers suggested that we scope out what we would want as features for this renderer. And um, 
contact one of the developers to see what the cost would be. And so we ended up doing that and contacting uh, North Road and um, getting a quote for it. And it wasn't something that any one of us could individually pay for, but collectively we were able to raise all the funds amongst 10 or 12 organizations. And within three weeks we had this palleted unique values renderer um, in the queue just nightlies and it's a really empowering feeling. So one thing I'd li I like to remind people of is that if there is a feature that you find missing or something you'd like to see improved, you can work on that. You can do the coding yourself or you can hire someone to do it. And um, it's a really empowering, important part of QGIS and any open source project. Um, another thing to, that I encourage people to do is um, if you encounter a bug in QGIS, report it, because if you don't report it, it's not likely, it, you know, it may not get fixed if it's not a common bug or if no, one, if no one ends up reporting it, then no one knows about it and it won't get fixed. So it's really important as you run into things to report them. So there's some steps here that you can go through. Um, you report those on GitHub and, you know, it's um, like the GIF here says, help me help you. Really. Um, provide good information when you're doing that. You know, you need to tell people what version you're using, what operating system you're on, all that kind of basic stuff so that they can understand what your issue is and be clear about what kind of help you're um, looking to get or what kind of bug you're getting. Um, so really, I guess the, the message here is to, to really just become involved and don't just sit back and wait for someone else to take care of it for you because you can be an active part of that. And this kind of goes for sponsoring new features as well. And there's a couple of links down here to these two blog posts that uh, Niall Dawson, uh, one of the QGIS developers wrote about how to effectively get things changed in QGIS. And those are really worth a read if you're interested in um, getting a new feature developed because um, he has some really good thoughts on um, the right ways and the wrong ways to go about that. So one thing I think most people have probably realized if you've been using QGIS for more than say four months is that QGIS has a really rapid release schedule. There's a new stable release every four months. Every year there's something called an LTR, which is a version you know, they coined as the long-term release. And that is supported with bug fixes throughout the year, but no new features. So for most production shops or people teaching with QGIS, that's the one um, they're recommended to use. And so if we look at the, some of the um, more important QGIS releases, you know, we had um, the first release in 2002 and then version one and version two, and now we're up into the three X line. And, at any given point in time, there's going to be a long-term release, which as we're sitting here today is um, version 3.10, Akarunya. There's also um, the latest stable release, which right now is 3.12, Bucharesti. And you can even install the nightlies. Um, so there's multiple versions of QGIS that you can choose to install and work with. Um, again, most people are um, encouraged to use a long-term release just because it's a stable version for an entire year. So um, it never stops. In, in uh, June, there's going to be 3.14 released. And I don't know, I, don't, I think there's still some um, ideas on what to name that. It might be called Pi. Um, and then in 3.16 in October, we'll have the, that'll become the next long-term release. So um, that's kind of what the timeline continually looks like around QGIS development. And um, part of this um, that I encourage people to look at is the visual change logs. So for example, 3.12 was just released fairly recently. So if you wanna know what's new in QGIS 3.12, you can go to the visual change log and see all of the new features that were um, part of that release that are new to it. And those exist for every version of QGIS. You can even go to the help menu in QGIS and access the visual change logs from the, the help menu within QGIS itself. They'll open up in, in your web browser. And um, with every release, I promise you there is a, 
an incredibly long list of new features that are exciting to try out. So, so long that I usually um, see things that I want to play with and, and try out. And it, it usually takes me, you know, months to get to them all and try to figure out um, a good opportunity to sit down and try some of the new features as they come out. So um, I just encourage everyone to follow QGIS. So if you're on Twitter, for example, um, there's a, um, an official QGIS Twitter um, account. There's also a lot of other people, a lot of news um, for, uh, for QGIS is um, put out on Twitter. So if you're not on Twitter, it might be a good idea. Also GitHub is where um, you know, the, the code for QGIS lives and um, where you report bugs and things like that. So that's another place to follow QGIS. And um, I just encourage everyone to think about how you can become more involved in the QGIS project, generally speaking, um, you know, at the very least, working with people in your own community to form um, user groups or meetups and, and talk about all things QGIS and support each other. So remember, QGIS is a duocracy. So ask yourself, what will you contribute? So I just want to thank everyone for, uh, for you know, indulging me in this um, and uh, keep using QGIS. Thanks, Kurt. That was a great presentation on the, on the community. Uh, we'll keep the questions until the end. Uh, I'm going to switch to back to uh, my presentation. Uh, so keep your questions that you have further for, for Kurt until the end and try to answer uh, as much as possible in the chat. You can still use the chat for further questions. Okay, so um, this series of seven free webinars, they follow the chapters of the book, as you might know already. And we are now at uh, chapter five. So we did already in the first chapter, in the first webinar, we covered preparing data from hard copy maps. We learned about uh, georeferencing, about digitizing, a bit of styling already. Then uh, the second webinar, we went into importing uh, tabular data like spreadsheets or comma separated files and doing a spatial interpolation. Uh, the third webinar was about spatial analysis with map algebra. Then last time we have uh, demonstrated how to do stream and catchment delineation, an important topic for people in, uh, in hydrology and water management. And then today we're going to continue with that about adding open data to your catchment because we need data if we want to do uh, water management, make our models uh, interpret what's happening in the, in the water uh, balance in our catchments. Next time we'll cover calculating the percentage of land cover per subcatchment and go into more uh, factor analysis. And then the last uh, webinar will be about uh, making a beautiful map with all these great data and uh, Kurt will show you uh, uh, that part uh, in the demonstration. So when we talk about open data, it's always good to, uh, to look at the definition of open data. And open, that's for open data, open source software or open access. It's not just open that you can um, download it. Uh, so a PDF with a map is not really open. You need to be able to, to just use it, but also to reuse it and have the right to redistribute it. And you can, according to the definition, only put two requirements to it. That's to attribute, so always say where the materials come from. And uh, you can put another restriction on it that is called share alike, which means that everything that you derive from it should be uh, also shared with the same license, which means also open. So once it was open, it should stay open forever. So that's about open access. And yeah, it's up to producers of materials, data, courses to determine uh, if you want to go for open or not. It has to do with, uh, uh, with the value chain. It has to do with uh, the business model, uh, those kind of things. But there's one exception where I have a, a big opinion about, and that's publicly funded data by governments. And um, you know, in some countries, they have really good laws on that. Like in Europe, we have the uh, Inspire uh, Directive. In uh, in US, they're also quite good at it. And I hope Trump is not turning much uh, back on that. Uh, some other countries also really do a good job, but many countries I work are not uh, fulfilling this um, statement that I, uh, I make here that I, I think that publicly funded data by the taxpayer to your government and data is then collected from environment, on water, on uh, all these things, that they should be available as much as possible for, for the people to do uh, analysis with, uh, to use it in GIS, to do statistics on it, to make models. And um, 
yeah, you already paid for it, so there's no reason why you need to pay for it uh, again. Of course, I know many people will argue about security and privacy. Yeah, that's super important, should be preserved. But uh, in my work, I often see that that's used as an excuse not to share data openly. And uh, this really hampers um, the progress of our work, especially a work that I do uh, for IEG. Um, like, uh, yeah, we need to make uh, Delta plans in, in other countries or assist in modeling. But if you don't have data, you can't do much. And uh, I feel that we are always stuck in that trap to, to get that data. And I hope with this positive uh, presentation of today, the positive webinar, you will see the value of it. There's much more to say about it. I have other webinars about that that I will also uh, share. Um, and that you really see that this is essential if you want to make progress. That's the same now with the corona crisis. You know, if all this data is not available or governments hide it from us, then yeah. That, that's very scary, you know. On the other hand, yeah, we want to measure uh, corona-related things with apps, but we also have to be aware that we don't want to share our privacy, and uh, so there are also limits to it. There's always a balance there, but don't let it be an excuse not, not to share things. And when you want to share data, um, traditionally you work in your GIS on your computer with your own local software, your client, QGIS preferably. But if you do that in an organization or in a country, then it's very difficult to share the data. And therefore, we have to move away from that and work in spatial data infrastructures. In the 90s, they were talking a lot about databases. And I'm a bit allergic to that word because that's just a part of it. And those old folks, they always say, ah, don't do that. We did it. We set up all these databases and they're never used and they don't work. Spatial data infrastructure is not a database. It's an infrastructure, like a road. And it's much more than just storing the data. It's about discovery of the data. It has a search engine, a catalog. You need to be able to, to find, uh, if you look for uh, rivers in a certain country, it needs to come back with the results, like if you use Google. It's about visualizing things before you download it. You want to see maps, you want to uh, query uh, already the attributes of your, your vector data, etc. You want to evaluate if the data is of the right quality for your use. The metadata is very important to make you judge if it's useful for you. And uh, finally, if you've decided if the data is useful for you, you want to access it, um, and not just by downloading shapefiles or downloading uh, a PDF from the website. No, you really want to have a live link with the data on the, in, the, in the spatial data infrastructure. You want to use it from apps. Uh, you want to create services around it and feed your models with it, while the, the data, the original source, remains in the spatial data infrastructure. So that's what a SDI is. And there's a relation between SDI and GIS uh, that most of you know, like on, on your, your uh, laptop. But you can interact between your GIS client on your laptop or Google Earth or any other tool with, um, uh, with a, a spatial data infrastructure. And the key there is the open standards from the Open Geospatial Consortium, the so-called OGC standards. I just mentioned a few here, there are many more. There's WMS, which is just uh, rendering a picture from the data. WCS, Web Coverage Service, is the, is the raster. And Web Feature Service gives you the real vector data. And if you have your projects around an SDI, you can simply connect to the SDI, get your data over, and work on it. And that's something um, that you can see here in this animation. So we're going to connect to uh, an SDI that we created uh, with help of different projects at IHC. Um, one of them was the Mama Se project in the Mara River Basin. Uh, this tool was developed by, uh, by Cartosa, um, where you can simply connect from QGIS Direct with a GeoNode. GeoNode is an open source stack for spatial data infrastructures. Really great tool. And here I'm just downloading the WMS of uh, the River Basin boundary, and then I can combine it with the other data. Another thing uh, that we're going to see in the exercise is OpenStreetMap. And uh, for people who know, don't know OpenStreetMap, I'm going to explain it a little bit. So I probably the whole world already knows Google Maps. But Google Maps uh, is very useful. We can use it to navigate, to find things. But it's very well developed in urban areas where there's businesses. Second, it will. It's not really free. You're, you pay with your privacy. It combines all your data from Gmail with other services from Google to, uh, to build all kinds of statistics and serve you with dedicated uh, 
uh, advertisements. But the most important restriction for GIS people is that uh, Google doesn't give you the vectors. It just gives you the picture. So a great alternative uh, is uh, OpenStreetMap. It's uh, voluntary gathered information. Um, so the contributors are owning the data. So you can be a contributor. You can be part of this uh, nice uh, community like QGIS. It has a very nice community. And um, people organize mapathons where you can, uh, you, you can map parts of the world. And this is an example for Kenya from uh, Nara County where we have our projects, where the Maasai people live. And, uh, good friend of mine is a Maasai living in that area. When you look this area up in uh, both OpenStreetMap and Google Maps, you find nothing in Google Maps, still not. You have to zoom out quite a lot to find uh, the first feature. Well, in OpenStreetMap, you can find the hospital, the schools, the roads, everything. And I know that people are using that in that area. Uh, these are uh, traditional Maasai people that, uh, yeah, that have to live in that area. How do we do that? Well, at IHE, we, uh, with every GIS course that I organize, uh, I also organize a mapathon. And uh, during our short courses in September, uh, Kurt already uh, joined a few of them. Um, yeah, we map a part of the world for the Red Cross. And uh, we did that area when there was a big drought in the Maasai area in the Mara River Basin. And it's great fun. I just uh, make sure that there's uh, drinks and pizzas and the students really do a good job in digitizing uh, a project for uh, the Red Cross. And uh, you then think, yeah, well, now that's a bit impossible to organize big mapathons and it's not very cozy to be more than uh, one and a half or two meters uh, from each other. But you, the good thing is you can also do it from home. So there's a nice tool, MapSwipe. Um, when uh, this recording is on YouTube, I will put a card here that points to a nice uh, video uh, explaining MapSwipe, a nice uh, uh, comedy that the two people made. Uh, but it's basically a tool where you can point uh, on your smartphone while you have some, uh, some time you're, in your, you're, you're doing your hobbies. You can just point to, to building settlements on the, on the screen and swipe to the next one. And this, this all feeds into the task scheduler from the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And you can find those tasks to map on the, on the website that is stated here, tasks.hotosm.org. If you have a login for OpenStreetMap, you can join these tasks and help uh, mapping parts and help the Red Cross and other humanitarian organizations to do their work there. That's, that's great to do if you're bored and you're at home during Corona, instead of doing other GIS stuff, this is still GIS related. We're gonna use that data, that's the whole point. So OpenStreetMap data is great for humanitarian uh, aid, but also great for us as GIS people where we are working in areas where the data is not readily available. So I'm gonna move now to the practical uh, part. This is where we were uh, last time. The styling got a bit uh, improved in the meantime, uh, but um, I'm not giving away everything because Kurt is going to, uh, to do that in the, in the last seventh uh, webinar. Uh, so you will learn everything about these uh, inverted shape burst uh, fill uh, polygons. But what I wanted to do first is uh, what we missed last time because of time is saving these layers into a geo package to proceed with that. So I'm gonna show that. So there's a nice tool which is called uh, pack, package layers. And that tool basically packages your vector layers that you have in your layers list. You can simply uh, choose them here into uh, a geo package. And you can, in the meantime, save those styles that you used here also in the geo package. So I'm gonna create a new geo package. I made a new chapter five folder here. I'm going to call this uh, your data. So geo package is uh, like a little portable database that you basically can store most of the things that you need. And instead of sharing shape files with all these separate files, you just have everything inside the geo package. I'm gonna run it and it's done. And then in your browser panel, you'll find it. So I made a favorite already of chapter five, and there it is. And there we see those two layers. And uh, you see that we still have the rasters not added to it. And these rasters, they come uh, from chapter four that we did last time. And then the trick for rasters is that you can simply drag it. And what I need is the, the DEM. So there is this uh, DEM clipped, that's the right one. I simply drag it to the database. And it says import was successful. And now you see that that's also there. The style is in this way not imported. 
I can start a new project and add those data from the database to prove to you that it's there and it's working. So I'm going to add um, the catchment boundary, the clipped DM, which I lost the style, so I'll style it quickly again, and the channels with the styles that were stored in geo package. So that's quite some magic. And I also had the OpenStreetMap layer there, so I'm going to add the OpenStreetMap from um, the Quick Map Services plugin there. So I'm going to duplicate this layer and do this quick um, fix of the styling. So I'm going to rename this one. And that one, I'm going to make a hill shade out of the second one. Let's first style the first one. Go to the style, styling panel, I choose their single band pseudo color. And just a bit of repetition of what you learned before. Create new color ramp. I choose their CPT city. And that will give me a few presets. And I'll just simply use the topography elevation one. If you click this box, you can save it as a standard gradient. Then you don't have to go through this all the time. But for me, that's always good to show you. Otherwise, you, you will not find it. Um, and then we have here the hill shade. And you will say, well, it's a DM. How can it be a hill shade? Well, there's the hill shade renderer here that on the fly creates a hill shade there. That's very nice. You can change the rotation, the, the orientation of the, the sun. And I choose here bilinear. You learned last time or in the map algebra session that uh, that will uh, improve the visualization when we are zoomed in by uh, smoothing it a bit. Then the only thing I need to do is blend the DEM. So it's the wrong one. I need to do that with the DEM. Have to be careful. Did you choose the right one there? And since I blended the hill shade, it blends all the way through uh, the OpenStreetMap layer. That's, of course, not what I want. So let me make sure that this is now set well. Multiply. And the hill shade is still, there's probably a bit of a delay in my choices, or I do something wrong. But yeah, that's what I want. So there it is. So the next thing is um, uh, to, to make a group here to easily switch between the two, hill, the hill shade and the DM. So I'm gonna add here a little group. Group selected, I'll call it DM. So I can easily switch on and off the DM. And I'll put this one uh, under the rivers. There, now we see the boundary. Okay, and now uh, let me save this project in chapter five. And I'm not going to save the project in the folder. I'm going to save the project in the geo package. So if I want to give this to somebody else, I just need to share the geo package and it has everything in it. So how do you save this in a new geo package project? Well, the geo package already exists. So I'm gonna choose here, save to geo package. And then I can connect to this uh, chapter five database that I created. Open. And um, give it a name here. Then I do OK. And let's see in the browser if that happened. I need to refresh it. And we see our project now in there. So if you share the geo package, then people have the layers, the styles, and the project. Uh, the styles of the vector layers were stored within the vector layer part, but for the rasters, it's in the project. So it's also maintained if I share it. Okay, now to the purpose of this, uh, this webinar to deal with uh, open data. Um, first thing I'm going to do is uh, connect to a spatial data infrastructure uh, from the, the European Commission. And uh, therefore, I'm going to bring you to a website of the European Environment Agency. It's called DiscoMap. It's an SDI, you see it here, search data set in SDI. And it has a lot of environmental data, and it uses these open standards. So I'm going here to land and it will load. And I'm going to load the layer uh, of Corinne, that's the, the European uh, land cover map. And I'm going to load the one for 2012. 
And there's here one in the web Mercator version that refers to the projection. And uh, if I click here, it opens the ArcGIS uh, uh, online, which I can also directly connect to from QGIS, but I need this WMS protocol. So you can read here the metadata and, and learn more about the data, always very wise to do before you download it. I'm going to copy the WMS, copy the link, and I switch back to QGIS. And there, you can do it from the browser, but you can also do it from here. This is the button to open uh, data sources. If I click it, I come in the data source manager and there's one here, WMS, WMTS. Uh, remember that I talked about GeoNode, that's the one here. And I'm gonna create a new connection and I'm call it uh, EA uh, Land Cover. Paste the link here. You see here WMS protocol, click OK. Then I do connect and uh, it will go to the server and comes back with all those uh, layers related to the land cover, the CLC 12, the Korean 2012. Now what I want is some transparency because I'm going to do it land use type or land use type. So then I choose the PNG option here. And uh, I also want to use the contextual WMS legend. And I'm going to select here first the wetlands. So I'm going to add it. Close and I'll bring it up here. So the wetlands here are in the headwaters of the, the Ruhr River. And uh, that, that makes sense. These uh, springs are there and we can check on the OpenStreetMap uh, what they are. And uh, this is the, the natural uh, the, the nat natural parks that we have there for the Eiffel. And here are the high fans in, uh, in, in Belgium. And that, th those are the, the springs there in, in the Eiffel and in uh, Belgium in the high fan area. So that's nice. Let's have a look at the other land use land cover in the, in the study area. So go back there. And now I wanna see uh, the artificial surfaces. So make sure that those things are checked, click add. And uh, there they are. Have to load from the internet, so it takes a little bit. And there we see it. We see that the headwaters are a bit less urbanized than the, the northern areas. But we also see these great purple patches, and that's interesting to look at in a bit more detail. So we can see on the OpenStreetMap background that these are uh, big open pit lignite uh, mild, uh, mines where they dig up uh, lignite here in Germany. And you see that the filled sink function, huh, remember from last time, just went through it because this whole mine got filled up by the algorithm, which of course is not possible in reality. So you can also add other layers, uh, but I think this is uh, sufficient for now. What I um, want to do is I'm going to add uh, things from OpenStreetMap. Basically everything you see in this uh, backdrop from OpenStreetMap, this is just a rendered picture, but I can get every data there in vector format in QGIS. And that's something you do with the following plugin. It's called the Quick OSM plugin. Here I'm gonna switch it on. It's uh, this uh, very nice plugin made by uh, Etienne Trimay. I'm going to activate it. Oh, it's a bit slow. There it goes. And then you find it under vector menu, quick OSM. So the quick OSM plugin is very useful to, uh, to get OpenStreetMap data, and I think it's crashing at the moment. So I'll just uh, restart QGIS. I'm using a lot of resources at my computer. I'm making the recording of the, the webinar. Add it in here. And there it's back and styled. So go here to, uh, uh, I have to probably install it again because it was still open. Probably not wise to activate plugins when you have open another uh, QGIS window. I just did that to uh, have a bit less uh, overhead on the, on the project, but that was maybe not a good choice. That's probably causing the problem. So this is the quick OSM plugin and um, OpenStreetMap uses key and values. And if you click this button, it will open a website. 
where you can find all the combinations of keys and values. It's quite a heavy website, they will load here, it's a bit cached here. And uh, you can see here keys and values. So amenity bar, if you look for, for bars and you use that one and it's still filling the page, but you can find if it's point or uh, line or polygon, a description, uh, uh, example picture, how many features are there in OpenStreetMap and how, to, how it's rendered on the OpenStreetMap. So we're gonna use these to, uh, to add data, open data to our catchment. I'm going back to QGIS. And um, first of all, I want to have the rivers from OpenStreetMap. So I'm gonna call uh, here uh, uh, waterway. And then I'm gonna query all the rivers. You can also use the other ones, or if you keep them open, it will download all of these. I'm just gonna use the, the rivers here. And I can choose here uh, in which extent, and that's an important one to set because otherwise it will look in the whole uh, database and you will uh, run into problems. And of course I want it here in a layer extent of our catchment, which is the Ruhr catchment boundary. So choose that one. Then under advanced, you can choose if you want it at point lines or polygons and uh, our rivers are lines. So I switch off the other ones. These ones you keep as they are, and then you simply run it and it will use the overpass API then to download those uh, line vectors. If you have slow internet, you need to increase uh, the amount of, uh, for the timeout, which you see here, it's successfully downloaded. Getting back my uh, QDIS screen here. And here we see the waterway rivers. I will uh, style it so you can see it clearer. I want to compare it with the rivers on the map, so I make them green, not blue. And uh, the blue lines that you see are the delineated rivers and the green ones, they come from OpenStreetMap. So you see there's quite some difference between the real rivers uh, that people digitized based on, uh, on, on satellite imagery and aerial photographs and the blue lines that we delineated. But you don't have always those rivers uh, available, therefore the delineation is, uh, is also useful to know. Uh, so that's nice, and uh, you can see then when I remove the DM that those green lines are following the rivers that are printed on this map. Let's do that for a few other features. So go back to, uh, to the quick OSM. And uh, let me see, in the book, I want to have the, the quarries. So normally you're gonna look for the, the right um, keys and values for that. Here I'm going to use land use as a key. And for value, I choose uh, quarry. I choose in the layer extent and the root catchment boundary. Go to advanced. I want them as polygons. I run the query. And there it is. And um, and we go to those big patches of the, the lignite mines. That's, uh, of course, interesting to look at. So what we see here is, uh, let me first style it a little bit. I'm gonna use one of these preset styles. So that's really nice. And uh, what we see here is that the delineated river goes through it and the one that I downloaded goes around it. So that's already interesting to see. And uh, we can also compare this with um, the Google satellite. So I'm gonna use here Google Satellite to see if there's any difference. And we see that it's uh, quite uh, similar. So what I'm going to show now is uh, again, uh, those layers from EEA to do a comparison. And I'm going to add here uh, the artificial surfaces again to compare the mine. So we'll load. And that was in 2012, if the classifications were okay. It's still loading, it's a bit slow, there it is. So we have to look at those uh, purple areas. I'll put the catchment boundary on top. So we have the open street map, we have the artificial surfaces and uh, the satellite image. And we can see that there's quite some difference. The mine apparently uh, moved. There's another very nice tool to do the comparison 
And that is this uh, map swipe tool. That's not the same as the map swipe I discussed with uh, OpenStreetMap. But this is very nice if you want to do a comparison. So if I click this and I click a layer, I can uh, swipe that layer. And here you see it. So that's a nice way to compare different layers. I can do the same with uh, the uh, Google Satellite and OpenStreetMap. So here I'm going to compare it. You can also do it the other way around. So that's a very nice tool if you want to compare different layers. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to show you because of the time, I don't want to go into the styling of these things. You can, uh, oh, that's well, a very important thing to, to explain to you. So you see that these things have this little chip symbol. I'm gonna switch off this uh, map swipe here. Um, that means that it's a temporary layer. It's a scratch layer. So it means that it's lost when you close uh, QGIS. Now there are two ways to make this permanent. One way is to click right and choose make permanent. But another way to have a bit more control on, on uh, how you want to save it, you can choose uh, save features. And uh, by default it chooses geo package and I can simply save this one to our uh, geo package that we already created, this one. And I can uh, give it a name, so I call this uh, quarries, quarry. And you can save the projection. And uh, now when I uh, save it, it will just go into the database. So that's nice. So you can do that with, uh, with all these layers and then you have that in, uh, in your database. We can prove that again by refreshing here and we see that the quarries are in there. Okay, um, for the hydrologists in the room, I also want to show you some other sources. There are many data sources, but most the problem is that uh, for areas where, where at least my students work, there's not so much data available and you have to rely on, on OpenStreetMap, for example. But there are a few websites I, I just want to point out. I'm going to go here. Um, Natural Earth, very nice data set if you want to quickly add uh, a lot of features to your map. It has cities, country boundaries. Uh, we use them also in the book and uh, it comes already with uh, pre-made QGIS projects. So if you go to downloads, uh, then you can download the QGIS project and you get all those layers, uh, raster and vector. Another nice data source is uh, HydroShed. And uh, HydroShed has a lot of uh, hydrological uh, layers, hydro basins, hydro rivers, hydro lakes. Many are derived from uh, DMs, like you also learned how to do that yourself. But uh, yeah, very useful to look at. And then uh, we have, um, this one that we use a lot at IHC Delft is the FAO uh, Open Data Portal for Water Productivity. Um, but I just want to show you the catalog of data here. So this is for Africa at uh, different resolutions. So just choose this one, uh, actual evapotranspiration. You can download it here, but it also has this uh, WMS connection. Um, so I just want to share with you. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, now. And before we go to the questions from the chat, I'm going to give the floor to our mystery guest. And our mystery guest is uh, Etienne Trimay. I'm very happy that he's here. And um, he, uh, he is the guy who made Quick OSM. And he has worked also, he told me uh, when we, we, we were uh, preparing for this webinar, that he also worked with Cartosa on the GeoNode uh, interface uh, with QGIS, but uh, I'll give the floor to, to Etienne and uh, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Hans. Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me. So yes, I'm the developer of QuickOSM. Uh, I started this project uh, five years ago. It was in the chip. And uh, now I'm still maintaining the plugin because I'm still using it uh, quite often. So I, I'm working on it only during my free time. Uh, the project is hosted on GitHub, so you are more than welcome to join me. Like, uh, there is uh, translations, uh, like the project is translated to 11 languages. Uh, always documentation. Uh, I'm keen of having feedbacks of like, what is missing in QuickOSM, what, uh, like, uh, how you use it sometimes, because we don't know exactly how, how our users use an open source software, because we don't have any like, I mean, we don't have a lot of feedbacks. 
So I'm keen yeah, to have feedbacks. Um, I have plenty of ideas about QuickOSM, like I want to make it uh, easy to download OpenStreetMap data when we don't know, for instance, the key value that you showed us, uh, Hans. So I want the kind of wizard. I want some presets, like, okay, I want to download a, a map about bicycles. And then you just have a full presets of queries, like bicycle parking, bicycle lanes, uh, and you have all the styling coming with it, uh, like already like the bicycle lanes, the one way on the streets. So I have plenty of ideas. It's just uh, missing times and sometimes, yeah. Like <laughs> so feel free to join uh, on GitHub. Um, now I'm working for uh, Freeze. Uh, it's a GIS uh, open source company. So we do QGIS core development. Uh, we do also QGIS plugins uh, for desktop and for server also. Uh, we do some uh, projects for QGIS with uh, some PostGIS database, uh, setting up some forms, etc. Uh, of course, we do trainings about QGIS, PostGIS. And our main tool is also a LizMap web client. I'm going to demonstrate just after. So. Just on quick OSM, so there is a few things that uh, like uh, I could show more about like what has been done just now. Uh, it's also possible to run uh, quick OSM using the QGIS processing model. Uh, you already showed us uh, the processing model, right? Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate this. Um, there's also some different actions that quick OSM is providing when you download data. So QuickOSM is basically scanning like uh, all the fields that you have in your layer. And if it detects like some mapillary pictures or if it detects some URL, you can open them straight from QGIS. Uh, so then I will show yeah, a LizMap web client. So what is LizMap? It's an open source tool like to help you to publish your QGIS project on the web. Uh, so basically, like we have some QGIS configuration, like where you can set up like the symbology, you can add some forms on your layers, uh, you can have some print layouts, uh, you can yeah, customize a few things in QGIS. You can also set up some uh, settings using the LizMap QGIS plugin to enable some extra features such as data viz, access rights, uh, editions, and the thing is that. It's like LizMap is using QGIS server. So everything that you do on your QGIS desktop, you will get it on the server and then in the web. Uh, the same, uh, like it's also available on GitHub. Uh, I put just some links like about the demo. Um, it's also available on Transifex for translation. So for now we have uh, 21 languages. So I'm going to show you a quick demo about uh, quick OSM and LizMap. So this is a, so you can see my QGIS, right? Yeah. So this is a project that I made before. Um, so Hans already showed you like uh, quick OSM. Um, so usually like a few tips, I just start writing like, uh, I, I saw you were using the drop down. Sometimes it's long and you can just uh, start and it will just auto complete. Uh, just a quick tip. Um, I wanted to zoom first uh, in my area to not download a lot of data. So here for this instance, well, I'm just downloading uh, like some fire islands <laughs> in the layer extent. Uh, no, can I extend? Yes. So with QuickOSM also, so that's downloading uh, OSM data from the server, but you can also, like if you have a local OSM file, you can also use this tab um, to load a local OSM file. So it, I have my fire hydrants now. If I check the attribute table, uh, emergency fire hydrant. Yeah. So I was talking about like, uh, let's say, uh, you see, I have some mapillary pictures. So if you have the plugin installed on your laptop, uh, you can uh, straight open the mapillary picture 
from uh, the plugin. Here I don't have the Mapillary plugin, so it will open the web browser with the picture itself. Yeah, here we are. You can see my fire hydrant. Um, so let's say uh, there is a typo or something like a survey date or something. I can also, uh, there is some default actions. Uh, so I can, for instance, use JOSM. JOSM is the main OpenStreetMap editor for uh, OpenStreetMap data. So if I click on it, um, it will open uh, JOSM or you can use uh, uh, the online uh, editor to edit this data. So there's a few like uh, actions like this. Uh, provided if you have a URL, it will open it in a website, etc. Um, so I'm going to remove this layer. Yeah, okay. So I was talking about using uh, QuickOSM in a processing model. Uh, so I already made this fire hydrant uh, model. So here you see I have an extent. I'm building a query, so that's a, so you see uh, I have a list of algorithm, and here QuickOSM is also adding his own algorithm in the toolbox. So I'm building a query here. So I'm downloading the file and then reprojecting the layer because the data comes in uh, degrees, 4326. So I'm reprojecting into meters in my local uh, uh, system. Then I have my fire hydrants. I do a buffering here of uh, 500, uh, 100 meters, and I set some styles automatically. So now, if I launch this uh, query, so fire hydrants, I just double click. So this query is, is like already set up to download like fire hydrants in my area. So I can use Canva extent. I'm going to save uh, my results. Uh, fire hydrants that is HP, so that's my area, it's my buffer. I'm just going to remove, yes. So that we launch the uh, model, the processing model, downloading the query, like the overpass API, and it will automatically styles uh, my query. So I'm just going to move them outside of this group. So yeah, that was for the quick question part. So now let's say I want to publish this project on the web. Um, so this is quite a, like there is quite a few things uh, in this project. Uh, I can show you that I have layouts. Uh, for instance, I have a district card. I hope you can see the screen. So it's an atlas for instance. It's already set up to have the map um, and showing like a per district, it's showing sub district. So it's quite a complex project. Uh, sorry, it's showing like some bus lines, some tramway. Um, I can show you the attribute table. Uh, I hope you can see it. Um, so here, for instance, I'm using like uh, some neighborhood. Sorry, it's, there was project is in French. And then I have a picture uh, for each neighborhood and I have also the website. And um, yeah, so let's say I want to publish. So I made a lot of styles like showing these neighborhoods, this tramway. I'm going to use the Lismap plugin. Um, so it's a plugin that you can download in the QGIS uh, plugin manager. And here I have a few tabs where I can set up how I want to share my project on the web. So here I have my fire hydrants, so I can uh, rename uh, this layer. Uh, same fire hydrants. Uh, I can set up um, some uh, link for a layer and also I can enable pop-ups, I'm going to show this. So there's quite a lot of panels that you can use uh, 
if you want to share like the attribute table, you can do some data viz. I'm going to show this. So there is like to make like thumb manager, atlas, to filter layer. So when I press OK, then it's saving a, a, a file. And if I go in my web browser here, so that's Lismap, uh, the open source project I was talking about. And I have here my QGIS project. And here we are, like Lismap is reading the QGIS project and making the legend again using the same rendering engine. It's QGIS server behind, uh, parsing your QGIS project, reading the settings. And I find again my fire hydrants here. If I check, I can find my layers. Um, I was showing you that I have some pictures and some links. So if I click on a neighborhood, I have uh, like uh, the data um, for each neighborhood. I showed you that we got some uh, layouts also uh, related to each neighborhood. So sorry, I went quite quick. Um, I can click here, discrete card. So it's opening the PDF that I made in QGIS. Everything is like trying to replicate QGIS desktop on the web. Uh, there is the attribute table that I can display. So here I find again like um, my attribute table displayed. Um, the illustration, the website. Um, there's quite a few things that we try to replicate. And the last thing that we are working on the next feature of Lismap, uh, Lismap 3.4 that hopefully we will release soon. So I know you already saw a lot of data viz uh, about the COVID-19, uh, but we are also doing like, we started this project uh, this week. So this is an, like, we are like, we can build without any programming skills, just using the Lismap plugin in QGIS. Uh, I can open it, uh, COVID-19. Yes, yeah, you have, have this project. Uh, I can set up some data viz. So in the next version of this map, we have more like charts possible, uh, HTML templates, bar chart. So you can set up and the idea is just to publish this one. So here's the result. So I can filter. Um, so this is a, for the full France area, but if I do like per province, then all the data is filtered for like each um, province. So yes, yeah, that was my presentation about like uh, quick OSM quickly and how I can publish back some data about my fire events on the web uh, using this map. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's great, Etienne. Uh, really great to, to see uh, that you make such nice tools. I think this also relates very much to a question that was earlier in the chat about uh, uh, dashboards. The last thing that you showed that's really useful to make dashboards. Yeah, it's, we are trying to, yes, like this data viz. Well, yes, it's, <laughs> it's on our map. We have also plenty of ideas. And uh, it's open source, it's on, it's on GitHub. Uh, or we provide also some hosting solutions if needed. But the idea is to really like, yeah, trying to replicate QGIS desktop on the web. Nice. So I'm gonna open the floor uh, for, uh, for discussion. Um, so are there any things, uh, Kurt, that came up in the, in the chat? Uh, questions to HN or questions to, to me? Yeah, Rosa had a question um, about uh, if you can share as WFS. So yeah, we can share, like all the data is available as WFS. I mean, it's one requirement when you publish as with Lismap, it will ask you to publish the data. And if I open my attribute table here, I have an export button. And you can download like uh, as a geo package uh, or GeoJSON Excel file. And uh, the WFS is we create, like there is the links also uh, here. Uh, it's publishing as WMS, WMTS. Actually, like we can also have WFS. Um, but yeah, we, we are using QGIS server, uh, all these OGC 
uh, services, WMS, uh, WFS, uh, um, yeah, FS. And then we have also some models like WPS to publish like uh, QGIS processing algorithms on the web also. Any more questions that came up? Yeah, Rosa has a follow-up question related to that. Um, how do you keep the symbology with the WFS? Um, well, it's all like uh, the server, like uh, it's, we are using the WMS, we are using the WFS, it's Lizmap who is doing all these kind of things in the background for us. And we are parsing the XML project, like the QGIS project, to get back like the form, uh, how like, uh, the, like the tabs, I, it was a quick demonstration of Lizmap. Uh, I couldn't show you everything. So, uh, but yeah, we try to mimic as much as possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions that came up? There's one, some questions that I, I, I was checking in, in the chats was a bit related to, to quality or resolution of data. Um, I always see that a bit differently. Um, of course, resolution is never good enough, but what, what do you have? What's the alternative? So I always have to see it like that, you know, we can always say, okay, if we use the Google uh, Earth, uh, uh, Google satellite for georeferencing, it's not good enough. Yeah, but do you, what, what do you have? If you have something better, use it. I saw somebody uh, sharing this, this very nice FAO soil map to a 50 meter resolution. Yeah, do you have something better? You should always ask that. And it's the same with OpenStreetMap. Yeah, that's created by people that can be errors. Yeah, well, do you have another data set you can use? Another question for Etienne. Where can we find something like a guide to use Lismap? Uh, I can put the link to the documentation, of course. Well, everything is on GitHub. Uh, I can put the link. And you will find the documentation also uh, docs, but I'm just sending you the link to the next version of the documentation, which is not published yet, but it's like the slash next uh, makes a huge difference in the documentation. Uh, it's not yet public, but I'm giving it to you. Um, for the webinar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so hopefully during this uh, lockdown for the COVID-19, I will spend also like, uh, it's on my roadmap to spend also some time improving the how-to uh, using this map. But uh, we try to make it as straight as possible. Just uh, make your project open this map, just open the this map plugin to create the Lizmap settings files, even just by default, and just start publishing it on the web. Of course, like I didn't show you, but you need to install Lizmap or to ask us like to host it for you, but um, just like the basic configuration. It's already just uh, nearly working. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, if there are no further questions for now, you can keep them uh, for the, the geo beers. I suggest uh, in the sake of time that we continue with uh, the last few slides before we go to the geo beers. Um, so as you know that we at IHC Delft offer a lot of uh, free uh, course materials. Check GISOpenCourseWare.org for more. Uh, follow the YouTube channel and uh, register to that. Subscribe to get automatic updates. And um, you can also find our short courses uh, on the IHC Delft website, really nice for face-to-face -face when the COVID situation is over and to go for the QGIS certificate. And we're working on some more uh, online courses also with, uh, with Kurt, and uh, we'll keep you updated about that. I'm giving uh, the word to Kurt. Oh, yeah. So I, I think people probably heard about this in the last couple of webinars, but um, just to mention that there's a um, program that I've developed called Community Health Maps, which is based on an open source workflow for public health workers. Um, there's going to be some open course material up on this site in the near future, um, including a two day course. If when it's in person, it's two days. Um, and, uh, so you can go through it in your own pace and it's a vector borne disease surveillance workflow using QGIS. Um, so just stay tuned for that. Oh yeah. So I, last week I mentioned that I had done, um, I was interviewed by the mapscaping podcast about QGIS. And uh, you can certainly give that a listen if you haven't already. And um, just as a, a shameless plug, um, they're going to be interviewing me about um, data, field data collection related to QGIS. So that would be um, input and merge in from Lutra Consulting and Q Field. So I'll be um, recording another episode of Mapscaping 
um, that'll probably be released in the next couple of weeks. So I'll let people know about that. Great. Great podcast. I can really recommend uh, to, to listen to this one. So um, next week, we're going to cover uh, a bit of factor analysis, calculating the percentage of land cover per subcatchment. We also use open data. We'll use the land use ma land cover map Corine 2018, which is not yet uh, validated completely, um, but really downloaded. So don't you, uh, we're not going to use the WMS, but we are going to use a database. And uh, the data plotly plugin will be used to make uh, graphs. So really something uh, nice for next week. Then, um, it's time for the geo beers. <laughs>